measured in parts per million and these two are in parts per billion. There's not so much of these two rascals as there is of carbon dioxide, which is why we focus much of our attention on carbon dioxide. However, if we look over the last, um, what's this, the last uh, 30 years, we can see carbon dioxide going up gen consistently, nitrous oxide going up consistently. We can also see methane was going up. It sort of leveled off during the first few years of this century, but then it's taken off again. So the methane concentration in the atmosphere is going up again. This is, uh, again, this is probably something with which you're very familiar. This is where these come from. Coal, burning coal emits carbon dioxide. Oil and gasoline, it's burning those suckers, emits carbon dioxide. Natural gas, and uh, Diane mentioned this one earlier, natural gas, when we burn natural gas, that releases carbon dioxide, but the reason that natural gas is, has earned, not really earned, has been a, a, awarded the reputation as the, the clean fossil fuel is because when you burn natural gas, which is largely methane, you actually produce half, about half the carbon dioxide that you do when you burn coal and oil, and so it seems better. It seems better than burning coal and oil. The problem, as uh, Diane mentioned earlier, is fugitive emissions. Uh, only in the last four or five years have we become aware of the fact that from fracking source through transmission to final combustion, natural gas leaks, because its global warming potential is 34 times that of, of uh, carbon dioxide on a 100-year basis, 86 times if you do it on a 20-year basis. Because of that, not much of this methane has to leak to negate the benefit that you get from burning natural gas. And that's the problem. The other sources of greenhouse gases are land management uh, changes and agriculture. I think agriculture has been historically underestimated as, in terms of its contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in the arena of soil destruction. So these are the main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide with a 100-year global warming potential of 1, defined as the index. Its longevity in the, as in the atmosphere is centuries. Methane, a 100-year global warming potential of 35, 20-year global warming potential of 86, longevity about a decade in the atmosphere. And nitrous oxide, again, as Diane mentioned a little earlier, about three times that of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the basis for comparison. They're always compared to carbon dioxide nearly three times, 300 times on a century-long basis. Water is indeed one of the greenhouse gases, but its longevity is so short it's more of a consequence of warming than a cause, although it does uh, get into a feedback loop. And of course, then we have also the chlorofluorocarbons and the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, which have a longevity of 250 or so years and global warming potential of something like 5,000 or more times that of carbon dioxide. Because the concentration of these is low, we focus on this one. But it's not the only one, and this is the point I want to make. When we are looking at pro proposals to address greenhouse gas emissions, to address global warming, we have to Remember, carbon isn't the only problem. Uh, too many times we have seen proposals to address global warming that only target carbon. And I know many times when people talk about carbon, they implicitly think they mean carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases measured in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent. The problem is if we don't say greenhouse gases, politicians hear us saying carbon and they think carbon's the only problem and they produce bills that only address carbon and don't address the other greenhouse gases. And so we get proposals to address global warming that actually promote natural gas which because of the fugitive emissions may well be worse than burning coal. The contributions of the greenhouse gases to overall warming, this comes from uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. This is 2007, and this is uh, the impact uh, measured in terms of watts per meter squared of heating impact of the gases. Carbon dioxide, you can see, is 1.66 measured in these terms, and that is about equivalent to the total of the impact of humans as measured back in 2007, 
methane of 0.48, nitrous oxide of 0.16. The interesting thing is looking at what happened by the time the IPCC 2013 came out. This is the more recent IPCC report. You can see carbon dioxide hasn't changed much, it's gone up a little, but look how much methane has gone up. It has, it's um, what, some 200% of what it was, its impact back in 2007. We should not minimize the impact of methane whenever we are com coming up with solutions, proposals that's, that address global warming. We must talk about greenhouse gases. We must take into consideration what are called the short-lived climate pollutants. This is a, 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 a photograph which illustrates where a lot of the um, fugitive emissions are coming from. This is taken in the four corners, and each of these is a, is a, a fracking site, and each of these is emitting methane into the atmosphere. Second question I'm going to address, why is state action necessary? And that's where I'm going to go to before I'm finished. Climate scientists, and again, I'm probably reminding you of something you're already aware, climate scientists concur with the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change that the, the planet is warming and humans are causing it, to the extent that 97 to 98 percent of those climate scientists agree with the IPCC. U.S. public opinion, a little less uh, con con uh, uh, concurrent, only 65 percent of the U.S. public actually agree with the IPCC conclusion. When we go to international leaders, uh, and this is the basis, a basis for comparison, if we look at a global map, there are about 195 or 196 nations on the planet. The difference is whether you count Taiwan as a nation or not, I guess, depends on whether you're Chinese. The United Nations has 193 nations. The Paris Agreement has been uh, signed by 189 nations. That represents 98%. So you can see across the planet, concurrence with uh, the IPCC amongst international leaders and climate scientists is very high. Amongst the public, it's pretty low. Unfortunately, we have a climate denier Congress, which is sort of parallel with US public opinion. This uh, is a recent chart of the, the current Congress. In the Senate, we have um, 38 out of 100 uh, who are climate deniers, and in the House we have 144 out of 434, 435 who are science deniers. That means overall there is just about a 66% concurrence with the IPCC in the Congress, and this is the this is the barrier to action. We're not getting congressional action. The only extent to which we're getting action at the federal level is due to the president's executive orders and stuff like that. What we need is, what we really need is federal action, and we need it to come from Congress, but we're not getting it. So, a lot of us have decided that in the absence of meaningful action at the federal level, what we need to do is to start getting the states to, to come in and, and act, and that's one of the reasons that Oregon action is a good idea. And what I'm inter illustrating here is the um, greenhouse gas emissions from the United States uh, annually, uh, and the, you see this runs from 1990 to 2013, and you can see the, the, the pattern sort of peaked around 2007, then we had the Great Recession, the greenhouse gas emissions dropped, and this is, in, I'll, I'll draw to your attention, measured in terms of gigatons, billions of tons of greenhouse gases measured in carbon dioxide equivalents, and you've heard that term often carbon dioxide equivalent simply means other gases measured in terms of their global warming potential in relation to carbon dioxide. So that's the pattern that we're seeing uh, in the U.S. Oregon's contribution to the U.S. and global problem is not huge and oft times we hear folks say, well, our, our impact is so small it doesn't matter what we do in Oregon. Well, I'm not going to fight that, Oregon's contribution is only 0.9% of the, the United States emissions. It's only 0.16% of world emissions. World emissions are, are up about 37 gigatons, billion tons of greenhouse gas equivalents running about now. But, and here's the point, if we get to all of the states on the west coast to combine, it starts making a dent. 
If we put, uh, this is in terms of the 2012 greenhouse gas emissions measured in millions of metric tons, if we get all of these states and provinces of Canada, British Columbia together, then we start actually having an impact. This becomes 10% of US emissions and 1% of the world emissions. So we're beginning to have an impact. But that's not the only reason that I submit Oregon should be taking action. From a moral, moral perspective, I think we have to ask the question, should Oregon be part of the problem or part of the solution? Uh, somebody was asking in a session earlier, how do we respond to people who say, well, our contribution is so small? And this is my response. Oh, do we want to be part of the problem or part of the solution? But even more importantly, if we think it's important, and we want to ask other states, other nations, to take action, we cannot do so unless we do it ourselves. We have to be leaders in this arena. So, when did Oregon start acting? Well, it wasn't just last year or the year before. Oregon started acting in 2007 with uh, House Bill 3543, a particularly um, uh, forward-thinking bill, in fact. Um, and what they did back then, they said, by 2010, we should arrest the growth of Oregon's greenhouse gas emissions and begin to reduce them. By 2020, achieve greenhouse gas levels that are 10% below 1990 levels. By 2050, achieve greenhouse gas levels at least 75% below 1990 levels. That particular bill also established the Oregon Global Warming Commission and the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, which is based at uh, Oregon State University. And it authorized the Oregon Global Warming Commission to examine a cap-and-trade system. So the idea of cap-and-trade has been around for quite a few years in Oregon. This, uh, this chart comes from the Oregon Global Warming Commission and uh, dated September the 2015, and this is asking the question, is that bill from uh, 2007 working? And what you're seeing here is the historical trend of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, up until 2012. The yellow here represents the business as usual forecast from back here. The red represents the business as usual forecast from a little closer to where we are now. The catch is, in order to achieve those 2007 goals, that's the trajectory we need to be on. Not only that, but we need to be down here by 2050. The catch is, voluntary measures in Oregon are not working. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. And this is leading to the conclusion we better do something about that if we are serious about this issue. In 2013, uh, the Senate passed a bill, Senate Bill 307, which charged the, uh, it ended up charging the Portland State University with doing a, conducting a study to see what the impact would be of uh, an attacks on uh, carbon emissions. This was done by the Northwest Economic Research Center of PSU. And this is what they concluded. <coughs> this is the trajectory we need to be on, but the most important conclusion they came up with was we would have to impose a charge of $150 a ton, and even that wouldn't get us where we need to be. So the charge that we have to make if we're going to impose the simply a tax or a fee has to be huge. So why is a greenhouse gas fee and dividend a problem in Oregon? I, I will confess, initially I thought a fee and dividend approach was a very good approach to take, but I have since changed my mind on that one, particularly in terms of the state. The first one is, if you're going to generate revenue in the state of Oregon, what you have to do is get something passed by a three-fifths majority, and you can readily appreciate that becomes a serious challenge. Another problem is polls suggest Oregonians don't favor a dividend approach. Oregonians favor a system in which any revenue generated from uh, a, a cap or a, a fee should be reinvested in activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
So because of those criteria, I have come to recognize that for Oregon, the best approach is going to probably be a cap approach. It also has other benefits, which I'll be happy to talk about if we want to go there. In 2015, House Bill 3470 was proposed in the Climate Stability and Justice Act of 2015. That, as you may recall, was a cap and invest approach, which was based on California's AB 32 approach. In 2016, Senate Bill 1574 was proposed, known as the Healthy Climate Bill, again a cap and invest approach. These two were similar in terms of their targets. They both were based on the 2007 targets that had been established by that um, <coughs> House bill that was passed and signed by Ted Kurongoski. The problem is we've already released greenhouse gases sufficient for a 1.5 degree centigrade increase above pre-industrial uh, levels as the Paris target has suggested. So one of the problems with using these goals is it's just not enough. We understand that. The difference between these two, incidentally, is an interesting one in that House Bill 3470 was modeled very much on AB 32 in terms of identifying, by basically identifying the targets using the 2007 voluntary targets as the targets, but primarily leaving the decisions of, of the details of the bill up to the Department of Environmental Quality. A lot of legislators, it turns out, are very suspicious of the Department of Environmental Quality. So when Senate Bill 1574 was, was generated as a result of a lot of discussions, um, particularly amongst Chris Edwards and his staff and uh, folks at the state level, what they what we came up with was a bill that instead of assigning the details, many of the details to uh, DEQ, actually wrote the details into the bill. Uh, it turns out that, um, this will surprise the hell out of you, the legislators are not very good at details. So as soon as you get a bill that has details, then they're going to start fighting about the details. But because they, then they are not happy with assigning responsibility for the details to DEQ, you end up with having to put them in the bill. That's what Chris Edwards said to us when we were working on 1574. But we have this very real problem. Using 2007 targets, we know scientifically is insufficient. So what's on the horizon? This is the target for this small short session. There are currently discussions going on uh, amongst um, in, within Oregon amongst the um, bigger, we call them big green, the uh, Portland-based statewide groups like uh, OEC, uh, OLCV, Climate Solutions, um, grassroots groups like us, like 250, uh, 350 Portland, 350 Deschutes. Social justice equity organizations are engaged in the discussions and we have labor involved and Diane is involved in these discussions also. Uh, representing 350-day shoots. So we have a broad coalition of organizations engaged in these discussions, and the effort is designed to develop a proposal that is mutually acceptable to all of these groups in order to get their support when it comes to uh, nagging our legislators. So I'm going to close with a few flavor, flavor remarks of the 2017 legislation as it's being developed. We have not a bill at the moment. It's not, to my knowledge, been written yet, but it's being developed. And uh, Kathy uh, is going to take some notes because I'm hoping at the end we're going to have some question and answer and some suggestions from you of things that we might be taking to our discussions, which we're going to be having on Wednesday about the bill. So one of the big issues that's coming up in the 2017 legislation is a transportation package. You're probably aware of that. So a number of folks are engaged in working on the transportation package, making sure that greenhouse gas analysis is incorporated into any uh, proposals and projects that are proposed out of that transportation package. 
They're suggesting we should focus on repair of our highways rather than construction of new highways because we know new highways simply add to greenhouse gas emissions problems. We're focusing on reducing congestion, which uh, you probably realize idling vehicles pollute more than moving vehicles per mile traveled, and incorporating public transit into the mix when we're looking at transportation issues. There is another proposal that's being discussed which deals with building codes, um, and you've seen probably during the course of the, uh, the day at least quite a number of references to the large role that buildings have in producing greenhouse gas emissions. And the proposal is to try and develop building codes that lead us towards net zero emissions buildings. Proposals are also afoot to promote electric vehicles. There are some proposals coming through which deal with community solar, and I confess, I know that we passed some community solar legislation in the last session. I am not sure exactly what these are doing, which is different from what we already have, but I'm presuming they're going to be improving the, the uh, community solar component of our, uh, our toolbox. Um, there is... Um, there is a proposal that's being developed by Our Children's Trust and Policy Interactive, and that is a bill similar to HB 3470, the CAP kind of proposal, which, if you will recall, was the one I mentioned came through in 2015, which assigned a lot of responsibility to DEQ. Uh, there's also a climate test for infrastructure proposals, and this is being developed, I think, out of the 350 Corvallis folks. And the idea here is they're trying to get a, a bill that would demand that any infrastructure proposals be subjected to an environmental impact statement using a full life cycle accounting of greenhouse gas emissions with an economic analysis that shows whether a project is viable in a world where climate goals are met. That's a very interesting one, and that's being sort of developed by a group outside the basic um, uh, arena of conversations that uh, I've been talking about mostly. And there should be a bill coming through which is somewhat parallel to the ones we've seen before, which is a cap and invest bill, which caps emissions with a specific enforceable set of targets and which generates investment should have meaningful and substantial greenhouse gas emissions reductions and the question, a big question that's being explored here is whether we should go with the 2007 goals or best available science. The merit to going with 2007 goals is that those goals have already been legislated and so then this bill would only be putting teeth into something that's already there, and it's very easy then to argue, well, look, you had those voluntary goals, and you didn't meet them, so we've got to do something to meet them. The disadvantage is we know that's really not enough. <coughs> it should have an authorized trajectory going through 2050 so that uh, economic certainty is assured. The inv investments would be... Uh, uh, assigned to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, addressing equity social justice imbalances, that's a big concern, and providing a just transition fund and promoting good paying uh, jobs with good pay and benefits. And as you can see, these two components particularly uh, reflect the concerns of the equity social justice organizations and the labor organizations. There should be a minimum leakage of jobs and pollution out of state. Leakage refers to the fact that if you impose greenhouse gas emissions, then some corporations, companies, are liable to go across the state border and simply start polluting in a different state. And so that doesn't help us globally in any way. So there are efforts to try and reduce that problem. Offsets. Uh, offsets can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but there's a lot of discussion about whether offsets are appropriate, particularly the social justice uh, uh, folks are concerned about offsets because they tend to allow polluters to keep polluting, and if the, that pollution is happening in a disadvantaged community area, that becomes a real problem. And so 
to the extent that there are offsets, these are going to have to be limited and regulated to make sure they're genuinely beneficial offsets. And uh, I think this may be the last point. Governance of this whole procedure is going to have to incorporate equity and labor components just to make sure that those concerns, those constituencies are served by whatever proposal comes up. And over to Diane to talk about what was been the Ben City Resolution. First, does anyone have any questions for Alan? I thought we could do them together. Oh, okay. okay. All right. As you like. All right, I'll, I'll move on to the Ben Climate Resolution then. Um, one of the things that, that we tried to do with, uh, is there another slide in there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I got used to using that. Okay. Um, is that we, those of us that were working on that, and uh, raise your hand if you're working on that. We have some people in the room here that did work on that. Thank you very much. It took, uh, as, as you noticed with uh, how we work on policy anywhere, is it takes a broad coalition of individual groups and or individual, uh, individuals and organizations in order to pass climate policy. We have to have broad community support. And so what we try to do with that is we try to follow the guidelines of the uh, scientists from the IPCC, um, but there was some sentiment that we couldn't quite, uh, we didn't want it to be overly restrictive. And so we went with just a slightly weaker policy uh, in that by 2030 um, that the city of Bend government operations and facilities will be carbon neutral, which actually is a very good one, which means that actually the amount of energy that they're generating will equal the amount of gen uh, energy that they're using. And, uh, but we went with a 70% goal, which is still very good. Um, and you know, we hopefully can always make this stronger if as it becomes more widely accepted by more of the community. And so the, the, they adopted, we were happy in that we thought we were going to lose the community goal, but it was retained in the policy. And so we have both the city and the community having pretty much similar goals in that we would reduce the fossil fuel use by 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050. And once again, uh, there was provision in there that this was uh, just a framework that really what we needed as well was an advisory steering committee and that that would be very diverse, would be composed of various members of the community. And right now I understand that there is a task force that has started out that is looking for funding for a sustainability director. We don't have one in the city of Bend and most of the other cities that have climate action plans have one. So I believe the Environmental Center and Oregon State University will be looking for those funds. Uh, and then the committee, there's a, a two-year window there. The city uh, wanted two years in order to form that steering committee. So that will be coming up. But that doesn't mean that we can't be still trying some things as a community and doing things as a community. And that's really what this conference is all about is we want to push that, that boundary forward. We don't want to retract. We want to keep going in a forward direction. And we feel that if we get the community engaged in this, it will do that. And so thank you all for being a part of that. But uh, are there any questions on any of that, on what Alan covered so well, by the way, by my dad? Jeffrey, in the back. I have a question about the sustainability director. It seems to be a bit ironic that uh, funding, if you have to look for outside funding for a sustainability director, there's no community buy-in, and it's by definition unsustainable. So uh, that's something that the city itself, if they want a sustainability director, they should invest in. I don't disagree with that. Uh, oh, we have other comments. Who is on the committee, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that the concept is um, that there will be um, an initial investment made by the City of Bend and by some outside resources to bring that facility onto the city staff. But over about a three-year three period, 
the city will uh, take over the costs of, of that particular position. So it really is a, a transitional idea. It's, it's not to, uh, to have outside funding for that position indefinitely, and Russ is going to add to that. I think I can do without the mic. The, the process, um, in, in addition to that, it, it may occur more quickly, but it, uh, one of the good things in terms of the timing of this resolution is that is, it is going to coincide with the biennial uh, budget process. So the good news there is a couple of other priorities to take a look at, which take precedence, frankly, uh, for the city and, and the council to address. Uh, they are going to be looking at potential uh, you know, earlier funding, if you will, at least if not partial, maybe even a little bit more of that. But uh, so there are a couple of options that are on the table, because as you said, um, there needs to be, a, what, what that ultimately says is, is there's a commitment to, to it. And I also want to add uh, on the, um, that advisory committee that you mentioned, uh, there also will be business, in, business involved uh, as well, business representation, perhaps one of the alliance groups or, or that. Thank you, Russ and Helen, both from Citizens Climate Lobby. The other thing is the city also really is going to be investing. Um, would we like them to invest more? Yes, of course. But they are going to have to invest in a greenhouse gas inventory and uh, some miscellaneous items, and they, they have budgeted for that. So it's not like they're getting off scot-free. Any other questions? Yeah, Diane, could you, or somebody, could you talk about what we lost, in a sense, by having them pass a resolution and not an ordinance? Well, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> but um, an ordinance requires another ordinance to overturn it. A resolution is more like a policy statement. That's my understanding. Russ, did you have some comments on that? Well, I, I can chime in on that in the, and anybody else that's been part of this. Uh, we asked for the ordinance, uh, and frankly, to to your point, uh, make make the point that this is important. Right. Uh, if we have been if we had been able to move the uh, move the chains a little bit further and gotten the ordinance. Uh, certainly would have had more teeth to it. Um, the, the, ultimately, we've got the resolution, uh, but we've got a resolution that does have timelines. Uh, it does have some accountability. Um, now, if you say, does it have all, what is it, 32 teeth? I'm not sure it has all 32 <laughs> teeth, but, and it's not, it's not a legal cons uh, requirement that's in place. But what will come later in terms of the implementation of the resolution, hopefully, as we all hold uh, each other and the council and the city accountable, is what will come later are uh, incremental ordinances from time to time as well, uh, based on those, those targets and based on uh, what the goals are. You realize that your committee work was just beginning. Absolutely. Okay. And that's, that's, that's why, right. to be very honest with you, that was, that's what we kept trying to articulate to everybody that we weren't, we weren't establishing anything in cement now. This was simply to set up a framework. It was to set up the process of that two to three year timeline, which is in there for the city's climate action plan and for the uh, community's time act, uh, climate action plan. Could I, could I throw in a comment on that one? Uh, the city of Ashland is going through a similar process right now. They have a, a, an ad hoc community committee which is developing a climate and uh, energy action plan, and a group of folks have proposed an ordinance. The benefit to an ordinance is it locks that decision in beyond the life of the current council members. And so with a resolution, the, the commitment potentially lasts as long as those council members are in control of the council. So that's the disadvantage, but at least it is a public statement on behalf of the government that this is important and you can always come back with an ordinance. With or or um, make sure you're electing the type of people that support right. that discussion. Which is why we need to hopefully keep the people in office that voted for this. Doug Knight, Sally Russell, yes. Nathan Boddy, and who am I missing? Bob Campbell. Campbell, thank you. And Eugene started with the, the plan and then they came back with the resolution, and they were able to, or with the uh, ordinance. Mm -hmm. So it's quite possible to do that. It doesn't mean it's not good. 
doing it the other order. Um, it's just different. It depends on the community and what you can get through. Now, now one thing we hope is that with the, and I don't know what this bill is going to be called, this is our um, second attempt, or is it our third? Third. third time's a charm. Yeah, third. I guess I, I forgot about one year. <laughs> it's been so many. Uh, we hope that if this bill is passed, and once again we have no idea what it's even going to look like yet because these discussions are just happening now, but we're hoping that this could generate some funds to spur on some other reinvestment in the, and that's why it's called cap and invest. Uh, that could generate, and we don't know for sure that that will happen, but if, it, if we are able to pull it together, uh, that certainly would be nice because if we get those funds coming into uh, clean energy and into our disadvantaged communities for social equity and other things, it's going to make life a whole lot easier for climate policy. <coughs> yeah. And, and Kathy was reminding me before I came that I really needed to uh, finish with a what you can do comment and, and I said well we're focusing on political action. She said yes but what can people do? So the point is when this bill comes through please get on board with it to the best of your ability and nag your state representatives, <coughs> state senators to support it because that's the only way these things are going to get passed. Uh, one of the problems you will appreciate that we have had is, in, in the last session, the Democratic leader of the Senate made it clear he was not going to support this particular bill because it didn't have bipartisan support. Unfortunately, that made the Senate control, actually, in the hands of the Republicans, which is an unfortunate situation. But it, I think you, you currently have a Republican senator, don't you? So it would be a good good, good chance to talk to him and get, get I think it's a him. Is it Brian Bokus? Bokus? Jenna Goodman, Campbell would be a whole lot more. Oh, Knope, yes. Oh, I was thinking of our representative. Yes, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with your reps. Should have checked before I came. But please talk to them. Get them on board. Yes. Well, but speaking of political action, we do have Jenna Goodman Campbell running for state representative. So everyone should support her. And we have signs outside if you'd like yes. to take one home. Absolutely. Yes, please, please, take a sign. please do. Because I think she would be a whole lot, based on our conversations with Newt Bueller, the representative, um, he did support the coal to clean transition bill, but we're not sure because we've been in front of him. Uh, you've been in front of him with a carbon tax, and we've been in front of him with a cap and invest, and he has showed very little interest. So um, I think Jenna. Um, Jenna gets climate. For she sure. gets it. Yeah, she yeah, understands. It. Yeah. And so what we want to recommend is um, if there is anyone who's interested in working on this policy with us locally, 350 Deschutes will be going out in the community and educating about this as soon as we know what it looks like. And we, uh, last time we got businesses, I think I'm okay, businesses on board to sign that, and faith institutions, we got um, our farmers on board, and we, we need to do that if we're going to convince our legislators, whoever they are, that this kind of policy is important. So please, if you want to volunteer on climate policy, please, um, we have a sign-up sheet on the front desk. Any other questions? Yeah, just um, how does um, Governor Brown's uh, legislative moves last fall um, correlate with kind of the bend and uh, Eugene and Portland? Um, she, she certainly was praised on the national side for making some strong moves, but does that really reflect? Um, I, I am not. I'm not. I'm going to confess. I'm not that close to Governor Brown. Uh, so all I have is hearsay. Okay. One of the major concerns that I understand plays to Governor Brown is the fact that the labor movement has a tremendous amount of impact in the Democratic Party of Oregon. And they were not on board with that legislation. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the philosophical bases for the process we've been going through is we may end up with a bill that's very similar to 1574 from 2016, but the key idea, and I, I totally approve of this, is 
we sort of went back to the drawing board and brought the equity groups and the labor unions into the discussions from the beginning. So even if we end up in the same place, they will be, they will have, we hope, have bought into it. So that's one of the things we hope. And if that happens, then, then the potential conflict with Governor Brown is not going to be there. But one of the big unfortunate consequences last session was, and we heard this, this was scuttlebutt, that um, that cold or clean bill, which did pass, actually had a, a negative impact on the comprehensive greenhouse gas bill, because a lot of representatives said, well, we'll give you one. And you got you, you got the utilities on board with that one, so we give you that one. And so, what the legislators have asked us is if we try to unite around one bill, and um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get organizations uh, to unite around the cap and invest bill. And we know there may be other things on the table, but for the most part, uh, the coalition that we have is about 160, or maybe it's more now. Um, groups across the state of Oregon that are behind, uh, or relatively behind, that, that just have been newly introduced to it. To really the, working and, together is the key. They're working together on the development of this policy. And to answer your question, Governor Brown, a lot of the environmental groups felt that she threw us under the bus last year because of her willingness to work with the Gang of Eight on the transportation package, because that's what they've done, is they've, because of the obstruction in the legislature, they basically says, okay, well, if you want climate policy, then we're not gonna we're not gonna give you this. If you want the clean fuels program, we're not gonna give you a transportation package. And so we don't know if we're gonna face that obstruction this year. And we're also looking at to what extent this transportation package is going to loom large over climate policy. Does that mean we're gonna have to sacrifice climate policy? Or does it mean that we're going to be able to work that into the transportation package, yeah, or how, how are we going to do that? And the other, the other wrinkle is that um, ballot, ballot measure 97. Oh yeah, the, the corporate uh, tax the corporate tax one. And we don't know to what extent that passage would be a positive or a negative. If, it's, if it passes, it generates funds, which could be a positive, but it could raise so many hackles that People say, well, you guys got that one. We're not going to give you this one. We don't Well, want and yet there's no money allocated for climate policy within within that within no. 97. So no. I got a question, another question back there. To Governor Brown's credit, she she could have caved easily on the low carbon fuel bill, and she did not. That's this, right. This is That's true. right. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't mean to sound a, a, a copying it. Kate Brown. I understand she's under an array of political pressures, and I understand that. And she is yeah. our best alternative. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, another wrinkle will be um, how the Washington State Initiative plays out, which is a vote coming up next month uh, to place a, a fee on carbon within the state. Yeah, which is and an unfortunate so, bill, uh, because it only does carbon. It doesn't do greenhouse gases, as far as I can see, having read the bill. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about yeah. that, but I'm just saying that, that that's going to um, be another factor, how that vote goes in terms of, of um, you know, what, what Oregon, what the options are. And the, uh, the other thing that I would just say for, for the research behind the policy initiative, um, the cap and, and invest, um, I think it's really important to take a good look at the European trading emission system, the um, New England Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, as well as the state of California, and, and see what has actually happened as a result of those three cap and trade schemes. Um, my understanding is that they're actually not delivering what's needed to bring greenhouse gas emissions down for a number of complex reasons. But I think there's a, a conversation out there about whether or not that actually is the best policy initiative to follow. I think that's that's an important point. <coughs> um, there was, a, was another, another question. question. I saw another hand go up over there. I just wanted to make the point that, you know, Maybe Measure 97 would be a wrinkle, but it's a ballot initiative. It's not a ballot measure versus a piece of legislation. So, you know, if the public votes to put Measure 97 in place and increase the corporate tax rate, it's a little different than convincing our legislators. So I don't know if it would be 
easier for them to use that against a climate bill. Well, that's what they do. They do use it against us, and they say, oh, you're imposing so many additional fees on us. So if they pass 97, they say, well, we can't possibly pay for anything more. Right. Okay. Not to say that 97 isn't good. I'm not saying that at all. And if it wasn't measure 97, it'd be something else. It'd be well, something that's, else. That's, that's, that's yeah. the standard problem that we have. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question back then. It's not really a question. I, I just want to go on record as saying, and it's kind of dropped in this room with a, with a, a degree of bitterness about the, the coal to clean transition. That was also a coalition effort and a big fight. So, I mean, in a perfect world, we would have gotten both. But I don't want to leave it dropped in the room that they're, they're at odds at all. And there is going to have to be some effort to make sure that the intention of Cold to Clean actually comes about and that Pacific Power or Portland Gas and Electric don't nefariously try to replace coal with gas. Right? With natural with gas, natural which they are gas. trying to do. So it's no battles ever won, you know? But we need to work together. And Cold to Clean was definitely a coalition effort at a statewide level. How true that is. Coal to clean is really an excellent policy. It's just that, as you say, we need, just because we pass a bill doesn't mean we can forget about it, is the point I think Connie's making, which is a good one. We need to just keep the bell ringing. Do we have any other questions, comments? Any feedback that you'd like us to take to the, uh, the coalition phone call on Wednesday? Can I ask just one question on, on, uh, on water? Cape Brown and what happened in Hood River with the Nestle plant, and, and I'm hearing a lot of climate change. How do the climate and water people work together? And I'm calling you against them. Well, I, 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 I can say, in, from the perspective of, of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, one of our projects is a water management project, a, a stormwater water conservation project, and it's part of SOCAN. So we are working with the, the water issue. We, we acknowledge it's very close, a very close issue. Uh, one of the big concerns that we have, and, and Eric Dittmer, who's the leader of that group, has is that, as you appreciate, as we as we lose snowpack, we are losing in the Pacific Northwest this little thing that I never knew before I moved here. That historically the Pacific Northwest has used the snow as its reservoir, and so the loss of the reservoir becomes a real problem. And convincing cities some of the cities where we live that loss of snowpack presents a water problem is is a is tough others other cities they're right on it but some of them just don't get it so i think we're together on that one would you like to add anything i was just going to say i don't Sorry? really know uh, and it's uh, this I'm, the question was really at the state level um and and i think we're in the same we're, we're, we're on the same page largely, uh, although I, I confess I am not in, in, instrumentally involved in water issues except insofar as we have this thing happening in SOCAN. Did you have a comment on that? Yeah, you just said that's for but I'd say having a revenue stream come out of something is essential because laws, resolutions, whatever, without funds to implement, just leads us to the next fight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and to the extent I just wanted to say that I don't know of any particular efforts with particular entities or irrigation districts that are working on this policy, although it would be great if they wanted to get involved. But because the pumping, the storage, the transport, the heating of water creates carbon emissions, it is a big uh, carb uh, carbon or greenhouse gas emission uh, dump into the atmosphere. So to that extent, we really need to be on the same page. Well, this evening's presentation is going to be on water and climate change, so I think this this well, discussion will, will come up tonight. And, mm -hmm. and there are, in fact, um, very strong alliances happening between water municipalities, irrigation districts, and, and climate change mm -hmm. scientists. So, yeah. so the, the, yeah. the, 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 the alert is the presentation tonight is on water and climate, yep. in case you didn't catch that. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah. The other part of that is that uh, on the statewide, when you talk about water, you've got to talk about the Columbia Basin and the fact that 
<coughs> that snowpack that you were talking about feeds the bottom of the power system. So loss of that snowpack due to climate change is creating fewer <coughs> kilowatts that are going to be replaced by coal. So that's that's one impact. The other the other part is that the Oregon Association of Conservation Districts is working on something called the Clean Water Partnership, which is work soil and water conservation districts work with agriculture in the state. Private landowners, uh, not just agriculture, but all private landowners on natural resource management. The Clean Water Partnership is, is designed to put initiatives to, this, to the legislature that will enhance the value of water as creating a, uh, a sustainable system where we can grow our food and pump our water for, for municipalities and have an abundant source and at the same time husband that resource for future generations. I, yeah, I think there's, 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 there should be lots of room for overlap on these issues and, and you've just introduced the what should be an overlap between the climate concerns and agriculture concerns. And as you were talking about water quality, it reminded me, of course, that the, the big problem with, with uh, global warming is the warming of the waters and how that becomes more, um, compromises our iconic fish species, yeah. and so on and so forth. So there should be lots of interactions. And the one that really strikes me is the one that should be powerful, and that's the the coincidence between global warming concerns and forestry, if, uh, as, as I was alluding earlier, if, if we have see the global warming happening as we expect it to happen with the business as usual scenario, I personally think that's, that's going to be disaster for our entire forest system. So there should be lots of partnerships going on here that just don't seem to be there quite yet. I think we're probably closer with water than we are with some of these others. It's just a continual effort to build that coalition. Any other questions before we? All comments. Up? All we comments. Could, we could wrap up. Yeah. For insights.